Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for joining us today. So today we're talking about uh, Revelstoke during the two world wars. So as you can imagine, it's pretty comprehensive and uh, just be kind of skimming and sort of doing a high overview of, of the topic today. Uh, but as we start, we acknowledge that the land around Revelstoke and on the Columbia River and its tributaries is the Sinaiq's homeland and traditional territory. We acknowledge the ties of the Sequipmec, the Okanagan Nation Alliance and the Tanaha to this land. We acknowledge our use and inhabitation of this land sacred to these four nations. We respectfully honor their traditions and culture. I also want to acknowledge that today is Indigenous Veterans Day in Canada as well. So we uh, remember the, the service of all the Indigenous people who served in Canada. Um, so Revelstoke had had a, uh, a military unit uh, since the 1890s. There was uh, the Rocky Mountain Rangers had been established, and they had a uh, a unit of the Rocky Mountain Rangers here in Revelstoke, and they built the drill hall for the the Rocky Mountain Rangers in 1902, and that's where Trans Canada Fitness is now. And um, during World War One, it became the local recruiting center. Um, up. Right before World War One broke out in August of 1914, um, up until that time, or really within about a year of that time, Revelstoke had been in a huge boom. That's when a lot of the bigger buildings had been built on Mackenzie Avenue. A lot of the fine homes had been built by then. The courthouse was uh, completed and opened in 1913. The brick, the new brick Queen Victoria Hospital where uh, Save on Foods is now, had been opened in 1913. Uh, there was you know, paving on Mackenzie Avenue. The, the town was, was really in a boom. And um, worldwide, the uh, world had gone into a bit of a recession just in 1913. So, but that hadn't really affected Revelstoke so much. There was you know, still, the railway was, was operating and the, uh, there was a lot of forest uh, operations, a lot of mining operations in this town. So Revelstoke had, you know, was, was a prosperous community at that time and was still one of the largest communities in the interior of the province along with uh, Nelson and Kamloops. So it was still a thriving, a thriving community. So in uh, World War, uh, so th this was the um, unit members of the Rocky Mountain Rangers militia uh, around 1906 outside of the drill hall. So there were quite a few local people who were already part of the Rocky Mountain Rangers militia and had had some, some training as a result of that. So when the war was declared, uh, immediately they started recruiting and um, the uh, RMR was doing the recruiting at that time. Uh, the local recruiting officer was um, uh, uh, R. Richard Sawyer, who was uh, an early, uh, he had a, a lumber mill in town, uh, was the, the band master of the Revelstoke Band, and he'd been actively involved with the Rocky Mountain Rangers. So he was the, the became the local recruiting officer. And uh, right away, they had a large number, they had 69 men sign up right away. Uh, not all of them were uh, selected immediately, but that was sort of the, there was a real uh, surge in you know, pride uh, as being a lot of the, the early soldiers were uh, from originally from Britain. So there was a real sense of pride and you know, wanting to do their bit for their, for their, for Britain. And of course, Canada um, was automatically at war when once Britain went to war at that time because uh, we were still part of the British Empire. Um, so there was there was a huge, huge response immediately and recruiting began right away. We have the list of all of the, the names of the people who, who signed up right immediately. There we go. Um, this photograph was taken on August 13th, 1914, when uh, 
the uh, local members of the Rocky Mountain Rangers uh, assembled at the station. And uh, it was just really showing a willingness to, to, to fight for their, their king and their country. Um, that's um, on the left is uh, Richard Sawyer. So September 2nd, 1914, the first uh, recruits um, were going off to Valcarche, Quebec for uh, training. That was uh, sort of the, the Eastern Training Center in Canada. Um, so a lot of the, when we, we have, um, we have access to the uh, attestation papers, it's the sign up papers of all of the soldiers. And a lot of them were signed at Valcarche, even though they'd initially uh, being recruited here, there some attempt, the formal papers were often signed in Valcarche, so you'll see a, a lot of those. Um, the uh, Library and Archives Canada has digitized all of the First World War records for all of the can Canadian soldiers, uh, so those those are all available online. You can uh, search for if you're looking for a specific name. Uh, they're, they're full, the full military records of all of those soldiers are available online. It's been a, a tremendous project that's been taken, uh, taken years to, uh, to accomplish, but it's um, really helpful if you're wanting to uh, look up a specific soldier, you can see exactly when they signed up. Uh, you can read their full attestation papers, which gives their, uh, where they were born, their next of kin, their date of birth, so a lot of, of information there. Uh, it even gives their height, if they had any physical characteristics, the uh, color of their eyes and their hair, their religious affiliation, that's all on the attestation papers. And then the other uh, records there include like any medical records, if they were wounded or ill during their service, and it tracks sort of where they were overseas. So it's a really amazing uh, material that's available to to find out more about the soldiers. Um, Ken um, researched the Revelstoke soldiers years ago and uh, focused on the men who had died. There were about a hundred men from Revelstoke who died during World War I uh, between uh, well, Revelstoke and Arrowhead and Malacois and Soul Squaw and that whole area. There was close to a hundred of them. And uh, he was able to create a profile on each of them. And those profiles are available in the books that we have here and on, on our website. Um, he also was able to track a lot of other people from Revelstoke who signed up and came up with a, a good 700 names of people from Revelstoke who served during World War I. So in, really an incredible uh, response. So there, we have uh, several pictures of um, the troop trains at Revelstoke. So the soldiers leaving for overseas. And uh, there was always a tremendous response from the community uh, whenever they were going off. The, there was um, two women's groups in town, the uh, Revelstoke um, Women's Canadian Club and the Red Cross Society. And they were both really instrumental in the, the war effort during World War I, making sure that the soldiers all had, had uh, packages that were sent to them whenever they were leaving on the troop trains, they had packages of socks and cigarettes and candies and, and uh, other uh, things like that. They had letter writing campaigns for the soldiers. Um, this is uh, 1914, the Canadian troops en route. So usually there was a big parade to the station and a ceremony at the station whenever troops were leaving. That happened several times over the, the course of the war when different uh, uh, battalions and contingents were ready to, to head onto the trains. There was always a response by the community. Uh, this is, uh, they would often uh, bring the school children to the, uh, the station as well. So they'd have the school children uh, on the hill above the courthouse whenever the, the troops were, soldiers were, were leaving. Uh, there was a local contingent of the, the, the high school as well. They had the high school cadets. Um, I think one or two of those might've ended up serving in the later, later years 
if they were close to recruitment age by the end of uh, by 1918. Uh, one of the once um, war was declared, one of the needs that they saw was for bridge guards, because uh, they recognized that if the uh, railway was attacked, it would cut off the the troop trains, it would cut off supplies. So there was uh, there was a lot of that was one of the first things that they organized was bridge guards. So there were bridge guards uh, and the Revelstoke Bridge and all of the all of the bridges through Rogers Pass. Um, it was um, not not a great uh, job, you know, especially in the winter. It was uh, cold and uh, and uh, poor conditions for for the men. But it was seen as a really important task that the, that they had men guarding the bridges. There's uh, two uh, guards at the Cutbank Bridge east of the Rogers Pass summit. One of the uh, first uh, fatalities from the war was a young man from Albert Canyon, uh, uh, Carl Leonard, who had signed up, but he was too young to for active service overseas. So he uh, was recruited as a bridge guard, but um, he contracted, I think it was typhoid, and uh, and died. He was only, I think, 17 or 18 years old. He was uh, the first fatality in Revelstoke, but he's because he was here in Revelstoke uh, when he died, he's buried in the Revelstoke Cemetery. And, but he, he has a war grave because he, was, he had already signed up at the time that he died. So he was an, an enlisted soldier. Um, there were a lot of uh, young men who signed up young. Um, I think there was at least half a dozen um, casualties from Revelstoke who were under 18 years old. Um, and that's when you'll see you know, the, their attestation paper will have one date on it. The census record will have another date. Their birth certificate will have another date. Uh, that, was, that, that was quite common. Um, I think there was one young man, uh, John Dockard, who may have only been 15 at the time that, uh, that he signed up and maybe 16 when he died. There's another, uh, Mr. Uh, Victor Kelly, who was a bridge guard at Revelstoke. This was, uh, the, called them the Revelstoke Boys of the Second Contingent. So this was the second group that was, uh, was going off overseas in uh, November of 1914. And we do have the names of, mo of quite a few of those young men. So I mentioned that the um, Women's Canadian Club was really active uh, during the war and their fundraising efforts. And one of the things that they started doing midway through the war was meeting all of the trains that were coming through with returning soldiers. So especially if soldiers were coming back, they'd been wounded uh, or uh, were being sent back, the Women's Canadian Club would meet them, they'd give them gifts of uh, baskets of cigarettes and socks and soap and candy. And then they would also sell candy and fruit and flowers to the regular passengers on the train. And they used that as fundraising for, for their efforts. Um, so them and the, this uh, Women's Canadian Club and the Red Cross Society, as they say, were extremely active during the war. They, they knit thousands of pairs of socks and send them, sent them over, they did letter writing. There was also a high school girls uh, patriotic society uh, of young women at the high school who were doing the same, same work as well. And we actually have their minute book and it has uh, some of the letters that were sent to them from the soldiers, uh, thanking them for their packages and the letters that they'd sent to them. And uh, it's interesting when you look at the the envelopes, they all have a censor stamp on them because they were approved by the censors because they they had to um, make sure that sensitive information wasn't being sent uh, back and forth. The uh, Women's Canadian Club also had a tree planting ceremony at the Revelstoke Courthouse on May 23rd, 1917 to honor the men who were uh, serving overseas I think there's only one of those trees still standing on the courthouse property, uh, but they they were there for 
for decades. Uh, and that was a, a tribute to the men. The mayor at the time was Mayor Hector McKinnon. And just so he spoke at this ceremony and he had just received news of the death of his brother, Leo McKinnon, who uh, died overseas. Did Leo died at, was at Vimy? Yeah. yeah. Uh, there were 12 Revelstoke men who died just at, at Vimy alone. This is uh, Jack Maley. His uh, family had a, uh, a farm, an um, orchard and uh, florist uh, uh, greenhouses on uh, the Big Bend, close to where the Baptist Church is now, Maley Road is named after, after them. And Jack Maley had been uh, a driver for his father's uh, florist business and was recruited as, as a driver. So he was, uh, um, his uh, occupation was listed as Teamster, which was running a team of horses. So that was his, his job overseas. And uh, he died in April 8th. 18th, 1918, during the last German offensive of the war. This is uh, July 7th, 1915, where they're still actively recruiting. By this time, the um, uh, Kootenai Battalion had formed, and the uh, Kootenai Battalion, um, they uh, were uh, formed in, um, they're authorized by Ottawa on May 1st, 1915 and uh, organized at Nelson. And the Kootenai region was divided into districts uh, and Revelstoke was, was one of those districts. Um, in, on June 15th of 1915, the Kootenai Battalion assembled at the Vernon camp where the, the, uh, the military uh, camp is still there. That's where a lot of the, the training was done, local training. Uh, so the 54th Kootenai Battalion assembled at the Vernon camp uh, for the first time in June. And uh, there were four brigades formed under Colonel Duff Stewart. The um, history of the 54th uh, Battalion says training was vigorously carried on. And very soon the 54th began to acquire a name as a thoroughly good sound battalion. The first inspection of the brigade was made by General Lassard in July 1915. And the less said about that, the better. So they were still, sounds like they had some work to do in their training. Um, but by um, the end of uh, June and early July, that they were uh, recruits who were starting to uh, head off uh, to uh, Eastern Canada for training and then for to go overseas. So these are some of the Revelstoke boys of the 54th Battalion outside of the drill hall in June of 1915. And we have the names of quite a few of those and several of those men uh, did die overseas. Uh, probably the child of uh, one of the officers by the looks of it. Yeah, some of those fellows look fairly young too. But. But yeah, that's the one in the middle is an officer, is probably his his child. I'm not sure if we have his name. And then this was the recruits leaving Revelstoke on June 12th, 1915. You can see they had a parade leading them to the station and a big ceremony at the station as well. Um, the um, battalion had a pet bear named Coots as their mascot while they were training in Vernon. And his handler was uh, Bill Durand, William Durand of Revelstoke. Some of you may remember like Tyke Durand. This was uh, his father. And he was a local noted hunter and trapper. Uh, but the, uh, the bear didn't travel with them overseas. Unlike the bear uh, that became the inspiration for Winnie the Pooh, uh, that was a bear uh, that uh, a Winnipeg group took overseas. And he ended up in the, his name was, was Winnie because he was from Winnipeg and ended up in the London Zoo and he became the inspiration for Winnie the Pooh. Um, but Coots didn't make it overseas. He probably didn't live much longer um, actually because bears in captivity didn't usually fare too well. The uh, uh, local doctor Hamilton, who's right in the very center of that photograph, right behind that uh, kit box um, was the uh, field uh, medical, one of the field medical officers for the 54th Kootenai Battalion. And he did go overseas with the battalion. 
and um, was injured and then returned home before the end of the war. But he was a well-known local doctor. He'd been a doctor here since the early 1900s, very well-known and respected. These are uh, Arrowhead recruits to the 54th Kootenai Battalion. And when Ken was doing his research, he found one note in the paper saying that at one point, there was only one single man of recruitment age left in Arrowhead. Like all of the rest of them, like there was still married men left in town, but uh, pretty much everybody else had, had gone overseas. And of course that caused a lot of problems for the the mills and the, the mines and the railway. Uh, that We have uh, railway uh, correspondence from the CPR and uh, they're always talking about how they can can get uh, enough people to work the railway. So it, it caused a lot of uh, a lot of problems back home for you know, running the country. And in the Second World War, there were more, more women who entered the work the workforce, but that didn't happen as much during World War One. So it really caused a labor shortage. Um, I showed this photograph. Um, this was the Oyster and Chop House on Mackenzie Avenue. It was a local um, restaurant. And this picture was taken in 1918. And I showed that because there's a notice up on the wall there. And that notice is saying um, what, what day they could serve certain meats as there was uh, rations and restrictions by then. So there was, um, they, that was the notice saying you, certain days you could only serve these meats or these foods. So um, it had an Im Im impact throughout the country. Uh, one of the other impacts was daylight savings time. That was implemented during World War I um, as a way to increase uh, production on the farms to allow more daylight uh, during the day for, uh, for, for farmers to be able to uh, access their crops or more. Uh, so th that's why that was implemented. And that's when income tax was implemented as well as a way to uh, create another income for the government to fund the war effort. So there are a lot of uh, things that came into place in World War I that are, are, that are still around now. Um, they were encouraging people to have war gardens. This is one that would just be um, close to where Padrino's Pizza is now on uh, Conant Avenue. And uh, so this was um, Emma Roberts. So they were growing a garden. They were encouraging people to grow as much produce as they could so that they weren't putting a strain on the food supply system. Uh, for because so that there was enough uh, food to us for the, the the troops and to send overseas. They also had uh, were encouraging local boys to join a group called Sons of the Soil, and they, that's where they were getting schoolboys out to work on the farms uh, because of the the uh, lack of all of the men who had gone off overseas to make sure that there was enough labor. So lots of impacts that you know you don't really think of. It sort of goes way beyond you know the the just the fatalities overseas. And uh, so finally, um, armistice was declared on uh, November eleventh, nineteen eighteen, and they had a big parade all through town at the time. Um, the they actually delayed the local parade because there was a returned soldier named Alan McDonald, who died as a result of his uh, war injuries. And uh, they had his funeral at the St. Francis Catholic Church and then took his body to the station to be sent back east to his family in the Maritimes. So they delayed the local parade until after his body had, had gone to the station and had um, been until the train had left. Uh, but um, Ruby Nobbs, who was my boss here at the museum for years, was a, um, she would have been 11 years old at the time. And she said that on the morning of armistice, her mother told her to uh, run to the story, store to buy bread before they closed all the stores for the armistice parade. Uh, but all of the school children, pretty much all of the local residents, uh, 
took place in the armistice parade. And um, a lot of any of the, the returned soldiers who uh, veterans who were already back in town took place in the parade as well. Um, the unfortunate thing about the timing was that the uh, Spanish flu epidemic was already in full swing in uh, in Canada, and there had already been some um, casualties of the Spanish flu in Revelstoke. So that all pretty much all the residents of town massing there, you can see there's nobody wearing masks, and it probably did cause an upsurge of. Uh, the disease and certainly in other parts of Canada, they were recognizing that armistice celebrations probably had a, an impact on the Spanish flu. Um, in Revelstoke, there were probably about 35 people who died as a result of the, the Spanish flu. Uh, and the um, 50, after the war, it took a long time for them to get all of the troops back to Canada. There was a lack of ships, um, there was really a lack of organization in terms of knowing what to do with all these thousands of men who were still over in Europe. So the 54th Kootenai Battalion were doing some work in France and Belgium and then sent back to England and they were kind of in England over the winter and they didn't return back to Canada until June of 1919. It was a big celebration for them at the time. So after the war, there was a lot of returned soldiers. Um, there were concerns about finding jobs for, for all of these men who had returned, because um, uh, a lot of them came back wounded. Uh, a lot of them came back with um, what they called shell shock, which is now we'd call uh, PTSD. And uh, so th there was a lot of lasting effects. The uh, uh, a memorial plaque was placed on the courthouse by the, the Women's Canadian Club, and that was unveiled on September 18, 1919, when uh, His Royal Highness Edward, the Prince of Wales, unveiled the, the plaque. And that plaque is still on the courthouse. And that's, uh, that's it there. You can see it on the front of the, the courthouse. And the... Um, Great War Veterans Association, which is the forerunner to the Legion, had taken over the old uh, Queen Victoria uh, frame hospital. It had originally been built on the site of the brick hospital uh, where Savon Foods is now. And when they were building the new one, they moved the old one over to the Legion location. And uh, in uh, 1918, I believe it became the headquarters of the Great War Veterans Association, which had formed a branch of, had formed here. And um, of course that was, they renovated that um, over the years. It burned down in 1962 and was replaced by the current Legion building in 1963. Um, you can see um, a little cannon. Um, one of, the, a lot of the, the uh, War Veterans Association were acquiring um, German artillery to display on their grounds. So the Revelstoke Legion was able to get access to that little German cannon and had it on dis display in the, the Legion grounds for several years. The uh, uh, War Memorial Committee of the Great War Veterans Association was formed in 1922 to uh, build a cenotaph even though there was a plaque on the courthouse, they wanted a dedicated uh, cenotaph. There was a real movement across Canada of building war memorials. So the Revelstoke felt that there should be one here as well. And that's actually on uh, this November 11th, uh, that will be the 100th anniversary of the unveiling of the cenotaph. It was, uh, it was unveiled on November 11th, 2000, uh, 1923. Uh, they had a campaign to raise money for it, and it was done at the BC Monumental Works in Vancouver, and Obi Allen Jewelers did the, the plaque with the, the names. And um, so the, their fundraising is kind of interesting that mo a lot of the local organizations contributed and were happy to do so, and a lot of individuals 
uh, contributed. The ski club put on a, a, a fundraiser. The Catholic Church did a tea. So a lot of people contributed to it. But uh, we actually have the correspondence from the War Memorial Committee. And there's a few, um, it was a woman named uh, Mrs. Haddle and her mother, Mrs. Marshall. Uh, Mrs. Marshall lost her, her son and uh, Mrs. Haddle lost her husband in the war. And um, Mrs. Haddle had a young child who was born before her husband went overseas. And um, they declined to contribute to the Cenotaph project because they said there was already a, a more memorial in town. And they thought that the money could be better used to help um, the wounded soldiers who were at returning and had so little. Uh, and there was a couple of other organizations that thought the money could be better bet, uh, spent like on a playground or a library. Um, and then the CPR declined to contribute to the local campaign because they said they had done um, more than one national memorial. And they also had a campaign to help their uh, their veterans, the, uh, the CPR veterans, and they didn't want to make, they didn't want to set a precedent of contributing to a community uh, cenotaph because they thought they would have been asked to contribute to all of the, the cenotaphs. But our cenotaph is still there. It uh, was moved because it initially was on a little triangle of land that was created by government road, which is an angled road that um, uh, angled from where the Lord Co is now and it angled through to uh, originally right through to Third Street bisecting the school property. And uh, it created a little triangle outside of the, the hospital. And that's initially where the, the cenotaph was placed. And then when they closed Government Road in the early 70s, they moved the cenotaph to its current location. So, um, that was the end of First World War, you know, and the reaction to the First World War. And then by uh, February of 1939, I think there was um, really an understanding that uh, war with, uh, with Germany could be uh, imminent. Uh, so there was definitely an upsurge in uh, people who were joining the Rocky Mountain Rangers. The, in February, the drill hole drill hall opened up to interview men interested in forming a company of the non-permanent active militia of Canada. And um, said it was open to men between the ages of 18 to 45. And uh, then the Rocky Mountain Rangers was actively recruiting as well and uh, doing training in uh, Vernon. So uh, the newspaper, Revelstoke newspaper of September 1st 1939 said that there were scenes reminiscent of the great war days seen around town. The news broadcasts and speeches were listened to avidly. The local commercial office of the CPR would would had would became kind of a rendezvous area uh, for people who were anxious to get the latest news from the CPR train bulletins. The newspaper said nowadays the newspaper news is old thanks to the magic magic of radio. Even the railway knights of the road, also like hobos, uh, were concerned primarily about learning what the European situation is. Large numbers of people have gathered outside the CPR telegraph office where two loudspeakers carried the address of Anthony Eden out into the space of Mackenzie Avenue. On, and on August 26th, the D Company of the Rocky Mountain Rangers assembled in the drill hall and they were uh, seeking volunteers for home de defense. Uh, so that Saturday evening, khaki uniforms were mingling with the civilian attire of the Saturday night crowds. Well, at 10 o'clock that night, uh, members of the unit mounted guard at the CPR bridge across the Columbia River. And um, it, they said in the paper, just like people in every part of the empire, the people of Revelstoke have not been slow in pronouncing a strong aversion to war, but at the same time, there has been no hesitation in voicing the realization that the present military diplomacy of Germany requires a firm stand on the part of the democracies. All indications around this community make it clear that Revelstoke is prepared to do its duty. And um, the 
at that time, the printing press was was here in town. So you could get news from that same day. So the the September 1st issue actually had a, a notice on the right corner of the paper saying that Germany had attacked Poland. And that happened on September 1st. And it, it was uh, right away. Uh, excerpts from Prime Minister Chamberlain's address that Germany must immediately withdraw from Poland or a state of war will exist between Germany and Great Britain was broadcast over the CP CBC. A large crowd heard this broadcast at 9.30 in the morning outside the CPR commercial telegraph office. The review called this coming conflict the first throes of a new world war. Uh, the CPR announced that their employees would be given immediate leave of absence with their jobs protected in the event of being called for military service in Canada or abroad. And other large corporations in Canada were making sim similar announcements. So on September 8th, 8th of uh, 1939, the review uh, said that uh, Prime Minister Chamberlain announced that a state of war now exists with Germany. And the speech was carried on the radio at 3 a.m. on uh, Sunday morning, September 3rd. It said many Revelstokians Revel stayed awake to hear the news. It said old timers were reminded of the last war when bulletins appeared in the window of McDonald's drugstore Friday. During the days of 1914 to 1918, most of the important events of that crisis were recalled on the same window. This time, large crowds are daily following the bulletins despite the fact that the radio provides a more diversified source of information than was possible through the ordinary news service of 25 years ago. The interesting thing when they're talking about radios is that in order to have a radio in your home, you had to have a, a license. So um, we actually have, um, were donated a radio um, a couple of years ago and it included the, the licenses for each year, the signed licenses. So I hadn't realized that, but there's a note on the, this little panel that our intern put together a couple of years ago that mentions the radio licenses as well. But certainly the radio was a real important communication tool during the Second World War. Uh, so these are some of the men of the uh, Rocky Mountain Rangers. I think this was uh, before the, the uh, before war actually broke out. And um, it, right after war was declared, it said this past week, D Company of RMR expanded their activities to more areas of the district. Uh, they were asking for any women over 18 years of age interested in forming a women's emergency corps to meet in the Smythe uh, Hall. And um, there was also in the paper, it mentioned that the soldiers pay was to be $1.30 per day. In 1910, it had been $1.10 per day, so not that much of an increase. With a wife or mother living at home, the recruiters paid an extra $35 per month. Each dependent child warrants another $12 per month. The dependent's allowance is contingent upon the soldier assigning $20 of his own pay to his wife or other relative who cared for his home. There was a note in the, the paper, uh, this is a recruits at uh, Vernon. Uh, there was a note in the paper on September 15th, noting the differences between 1914 and 1939, said there was practically no excitement as there had been during the first war, that there was quiet and assurance, soberness and determination, remarkably little hatred or fear. The editorial said, this is not merely war against Germany. It is a war of democracy against Hitlerism, against dictatorship against aggression, a war for the right of free peoples to live their own lives without fear. There is a grim determination about this war. There is no bandwagon, no slogan about the war to end war. There is a determination that the German menace shall be crushed for all time. Uh, these are uh, some of the men uh, getting ready to go overseas. This uh, man right there, uh, is uh, Jim English, Ken's father, and, uh, and I think that's Wally Mulholland there. Not sure of the other, the other ones. And um, there's 
again, the, uh, some of the men at the Revelstoke station, this one right under the O is Jim English. There was um, actually a, a note about um, I can't find it easily here. Um, but so there was right away there were men uh, heading off for overseas service. A lot of them served uh, in uh, in in uh, France and Belgium and also in Italy and North Africa. These are some of the Rocky Mountain Rangers at Camp uh, Petawawa in Ontario in July of 1942 in training. Uh, there were several uh, local men who had uh, joined the uh, Royal Air Force uh, rather than the Royal Canadian Air Force. They'd actually joined uh, the, the British Air Force and uh, then several others who also joined the, the RCAF, the Royal Canadian Air Force. Um, the uh, first Canadian flyers who went overseas were um, uh, Revel former Revelstoke residents, Russell Donaldson, Malcolm McFadgen and Howard Cotterell. And uh, both of them had been commercial flyers uh, prior to uh, being attached to the Air Force. Um, the uh, Big Bend Highway opened at Bowdoin Camp at the end of June in 1940. It had been under construction for several years and construction had been delayed quite a bit due to the depression. But it was, um, once war was declared, there was a real push to get it open. And uh, it was um, really the, the first sort of uh, travel route, you know, uh, road route to get uh, uh, across Canada like from here to Golden and then on from there. So it was uh, seen as a really important um, contribution uh, to the, the war effort to have the, the highway opened. And actually one of the first fatalities after the highway opened was a, uh, a, a one of a truck from a military convoy that was going through and went off the cliff and it was a fatality. Um, the locals were really um, helping in any way they could. There were uh, uh, any of the soldiers who were, there was a lot of uh, Australian soldiers who were uh, mostly airmen who were stationed and doing training in Calgary. And uh, over the Christmas holidays, they had uh, they were sent out to Revelstoke so they could have a uh, have family Christmas with Revelstoke families. So there were you know a whole several several um, Australian soldiers who came to Revelstoke. Uh, this man was um, can't remember his name right off the top of my head, but he was with the Australian Air Force, and they nicknamed him Snowy. Uh, because the local ski club made sure that they took all of these guys up to the ski hill and taught them how to ski. And their first few uh, tries, <laughs> and they ended up looking like that. Uh, but they uh, picked it up pretty quickly. Um, the, um, this is um, uh, Jack Hallam. And we have quite a bit of uh, his uh, war memorabilia, his uh, soldier's pay book. Uh, this is a photograph of him in uniform. And I believe he served quite a bit in um, uh, North Africa and Italy while he was overseas. And this is uh, some of the some of the records that he had at a Christmas dinner in Italy in 1944. The um, one, the the first uh, one of the first fatalities in Revelstoke was a man named uh, George Perry who had signed up with the Royal Air Force. And um, he was, uh, uh, had been born in Revelstoke 20 years prior uh, to his death, uh, the son of Mr. and Mrs. A.W. Perry. And uh, they received word on April 16th, 1940, that he had been reported missing and believed drowned. The uh, locally there was a uh, Revelstoke Servicemen's Hostess Club. Again, the the Red Cross Society was very involved as well. Again, knitting lots of socks and sending parcels, and then they had this local club. So whenever there were uh, soldiers in town, 
they would make sure that they were, you know, they'd, they'd have dancing partners, you know, they'd have entertainment for them. And this group was also raising money for the, the soldiers overseas. They had lo- big letter writing campaigns. We actually have uh, a book in the archives with a list of all of the parcels that were sent overseas from Revelstoke and the huge number of socks and cigarettes and other things that were sent over. Um, in uh, 1944, the Revelstoke Kinsman Club started the Golden Spike Days, and it was uh, done as a way to sort of improve the local economy, uh, lift up spirits, and uh, a lot of these groups that were also raising money for the war efforts. Um, the uh, Canada had a victory bond program underway. And um, the headquarters was in the building we, at the corner of Mackenzie and First. There's a picture of it on the wall there, the one that a lot of us would remember as the Revelstoke Review Office. So there was, uh, they, and Revelstoke usually met or exceeded its goals for the victory bond uh, sales. So that was a huge program across Canada to raise money for the war effort. And uh, you can see most of the, the floats in the uh, big, in the, Golden Spike Days Parade were really focused around the, the war. It was definitely on everybody's minds. Um, the uh, one, one of the local service clubs was had a campaign for um, milk for Britain. So they're raising money to make sure that uh, children in Britain had access to milk. So of course, you know, the war uh, drew on for a a long time. And um, in one of the the turning points of the war was uh, D-Day at um, Normandy. And one Revelstoke man, Ernest F.J. Phillips, uh, died on June 11th, 1944, as a result of wounds that he received on D-Day. Uh, Phillips was 37 years old and had come to Revelstoke with his parents in 1920. He attended school here and went to work in his father's painting and decorating business. He enlisted in 1914 with the 2nd Battalion Canadian Scottish and left for England on September 9th. Uh, He was married in Brighton, England in 1943 and had been looking forward to bringing his war bride to uh, Canada to make their home here after the war. so he was uh, a fatality at uh, at Normandy. Uh, the last Revelstoke ca- casualty was Carmen Caponero, who died on April 21st, 1945, in action in Germany. He had been born in Revelstoke, one of the pioneer Italian families here, and he'd uh, left a wife and two young sons when he died. Um, so uh, finally, uh, war in Europe, uh, VE Day, Victory in Europe Day, was uh, declared on May 8th, 1945. And uh, there's the headline in the May 10th uh, newspaper, Revelstoke rejoices as war ends in Europe this week. Um, The newspaper said, after many false alarms, victory came in the European theater of war Monday morning at 2.41, after almost six years of blazing warfare. A broadcast at one o'clock by acting prime minister J.L. Ilsley made the announcement official, and Revelstoke observed a holiday for the rest of the afternoon, as well as on Tuesday. Flags appeared in homes, and business places were quick in getting out decorations. The big flag of the eighth victory loan stood outside of the victory loan office, a reminder to everyone that the loan was still vital to the success of the second phase of the struggles, the war against Japan. The annual inspection of Rotary's Air Cadet Squadron Monday afternoon contributed a holiday atmosphere to the day. In, in the evening, a free dance given by the kinsmen at the Civic Center attracted a large crowd. And then on um, the uh, fi- war finally came to an end in August and the August 16th uh, paper has this uh, large headline, Second World War Ends. So um, huge relief to, to everyone. And um, the newspaper said, Revelstoke celebrates event in contrast to quiet observation of VE Day, boisterous relief Tuesday night, Thanksgiving service, parade and children's day on Wednesday. 
Peace came to a war-weary world Tuesday afternoon after several days of premature announcements and rumors. In the business section of Revelstoke, almost everyone sought the nearest radio just before the appointed hour. Soon after, stores closed, and before long, automobile horns and locomotive whistles proclaimed the good news. Engine 5916, backing down a track in the yards, made a particularly good demonstration as the sounds of its whistle mingled with the noise in the business section. Papers of all description fluttered around the streets. It was all in distinct contrast to the quiet which prevailed on VE Day. The celebrating continued throughout the evening. Decorated automobiles made plenty of noise. Jock Inkster was loudly cheered as he paraded down the CPR platform playing the bagpipes. Dancing to music supplied by the rhythm makers, dancers had a good time on Mackenzie Avenue Tuesday and Wednesday nights. A Thanksgiving service was held at the United Church. On Wednesday, a parade of veterans of all of the services of this war, as well as the last, formed at the City Hall and led by Revelstoke Band, paraded to Recreation Park, which is now Queen Elizabeth Park. And they had uh, children's events at the park with free refreshments. So again, the end of the, the, the Second World War and uh, men coming back, trying to get back to, uh, to normal life um, they uh, added a World War II memorial plaque to the Cenotaph. There were 32 names on the World War II plaque. And we have a m memory book of the World War II uh, soldiers here and on our website as well. And one of the impacts of all of the returning soldiers, most of them were of... Uh, marrying age. They got married soon after they came back and they were looking for housing. And the uh, Housing Commission and the Veterans Association agreed to uh, do what was referred to as the wartime houses, you know, they were built after the war. Um, so most of those little cottages uh, on like, um, 5th, 6th, 7th and 8th Street between like, um, uh, Vernon and sort of in that area, all those little little cottages, those were built as the returning houses for returning soldiers. Uh, the Englishes moved in there with their their one year old son and uh, Ken, and then they had their second child there. Uh, so it was it, it was a good transition for a lot of the soldiers to have that uh, that housing. So when you're looking at all those little cottages, that's where they that's how they came about. Most of them are do look pretty good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, the um, Revelstoke uh, High School put out a uh, memorial issue after the end of the war with the uh, pictures um, of, of a lot of the, the high school students who had died uh, during the war. And uh, so the Cenotaph uh, stood in that location. That was the the renovated, the old uh, the old Legion building. They had done extensive renovations on it, and as I said it was there until it burned down in 1962 and was replaced by the current one in 1963. So this is our. Um, if you go to our website, RevelstokeMuseum.ca, under collections you'll find the World War I profiles. And um, there's the piece there, the impact of World War I in Revelstoke. That's a, an address that Ken did about uh, World War I. And then there's, you find the names of each of the men that died that we were able to find information on. So you can read about their profiles there. And then we also have the memorial book for the World War II soldiers. We probably need to do to flesh out their biographies a little bit more, but we do have at least their names and uh, when the, when they died and a little bit of information about them as well. So the next brown bag is on November 22nd, and uh, the topic will be uh, Mount Begby Elementary School. Our guest speaker is Rosemary Tracy, who went to the school and taught there for several years as well. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us today.